Thank you. All right. Okay. We will. Where is he? Oh, maybe if I do that. All right, I'm just getting set up here. All right. Okay, so back to diagramming and uh, we're just going to jump right in. I've picked out a few more passages from Ephesians that have different features. Uh, that I think will be helpful and just as we continue to uh, to to look at some text together and, and how we can identify the phrases and the clauses and all the stuff we've been talking about and then and then I'll show you the diagrams from each of those and then this time I've picked some passages that have little hidden things in them that we can um, find together and um, Maybe I'll help you to think of some things as you're studying as well. So I'll show you what those are as we go uh, along together. All right. Um, so again, our goal, identify the main sentence in the paragraph, and then we're identifying phrases and clauses and seeing how they connect to each other. I mean, that's what diagramming is. And we've already covered these definitions, but I just put them here to, uh, to remind us, um, you know, in a sentence, we have clauses and phrases essentially, right? And then the two clauses we look at are the independent ones and the dependent ones. Now the clause, remember, has a subject and a verb. A phrase does not have both a subject and a verb. That's the only difference, all right? So when I ask you as we go through the examples, you know, is this a phrase or a clause? What you're looking for is just, is there a verb and a subject? If there is, you have a clause. If there's not, you have a phrase. And then we determine, is this clause dependent or independent? All right, dependent ones mean they don't stand by themselves. There's some word at the beginning of the clause that connects it to something else in the sentence. All right, so, um, and then of course the subject, the verb, and the object. Again, it all has to do with uh, the subject carries out the action or is being described. The verb is the action or the state or condition of the subject. And then the object is the recipient of the action. Now. Um, let me ask you, uh, Renee, uh, when would we not have an object? What kind of verb does not have an object? Do you remember? Yeah, the, uh, the, the action, uh, can you repeat again the question? Pastor yeah, sure. There are two kinds of verbs. Which kind of verb would not have an object? One kind of verb has an object. Another kind of verb does not have an object. Uh, verb referring to the state of condition. Yes, good. So if the verb is an action verb, then it, it, might, it could have an object, something that yes. receives the action. But if it's a state of being verb is were, will be, are, become, those are state of being. Those do not have an object because there's no action. It's just a description. So we call those, instead of an object, they might, they'll be a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative. Again, a predicate adjective would be something like they are tired, okay, or he is full. Uh, these are descriptions they're not actions all right so they have the verb the state of being a predicate nominative will be something like um, tabs is a pastor or um, bj is a basketball player all right in this case again these are descriptions but the description is a noun this time up here the description was an adjective okay now an object only happens if if it were something to the effect of uh, Tito Raleigh makes frames 
all right? Or better word would say builds, frames. Builds is an action verb, right? So, so frames would be an object. It's what receives the action or participates in it. Okay, so that's the difference. We'll just keep that in mind. So the structure looks very similar. You have a subject and then you have a verb, but what comes after the verb will depend on what kind of verb it is. Uh, if it's an object, it's following an action verb. All right, those verbs that describe an action. If it's, um, an, if it's not an action, then it will be a description, either an adjective or a noun. Okay, but the sentence will look very similar. Notice, sub, subject they, verb are tired, predicate adjective. Uh, Raleigh, subject, builds, verb, frames, object. So it's a similar structure, but there is a slight difference in describing um, that third word there, what follows the verb, okay? So just keep this in mind. Uh, these are our building blocks for where we're going forward. Now. Uh, we're going to follow the same type of format as we have before, and that is uh, where I, I'm going to ask uh, one of you to, and this is where I think a customer's coming in, Tito Raleigh, so maybe uh, be ready. Um, <laughs> I'll ask one of you to just identify the independent clause, that is the main subject and verb and object um, of the the passage I give you, and then we'll look at after that the different phrases and clauses that follow. Okay, so so tabs. I'm gonna since you're at the top of the page, I'm gonna pick on you first. Uh, in this passage, go ahead and read the passage I have here, <clears throat> and then uh, identify the independent clause. Ephesians six ten to twelve. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, <laughs> against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Okay, good. Uh, I'll what will I identify first, Pastor? Sorry, the independent clause. Um, and usually it's at the beginning or near the beginning. Um, I think that the independent clause is the command to be strong in the Lord. Okay. Right here? Yes, Pastor. All right. And so tell me then, what is the subject? Um, the implied you, because it's a command. Good. You be, be strong. You be strong in the Lord. Okay. And then tell me, what is the verb? Uh the, the verb is the be. Okay, but, good. Uh, the, it's a state of being, so it's a predicate adjective as discussed earlier. So okay, the, good. So strong. no object, right? Yes, yes, no object. Because no action. All right, good. So we have, what did you say, a predicate adjective? Yes, Pastor. And that is? Uh, the state of being, of being strong in the Lord. Strong. Okay, good. Now you added in the Lord. Is in the Lord part of the predicate adjective? Or is it something uh, else? It is describing the kind of uh, strength that we are to, to have. Okay. So would you call in the Lord part of the predicate adjective? Or is it a... Phrase or clause, separate phrase or clause. It's a separate phrase. Yes. Okay, good. So actually, the independent clause is just these two words, be ah. strong, right? Because yes. in the Lord, I'll use a different color here. In the Lord is a phrase or clause. A phrase, Pastor? Yeah, because no subject or verb. And it describes, and you said it correctly, it modifies uh, strong, right? How, how they're to be strong? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Are, are telling you something about the, the strength. Uh, be strong uh, in the Lord. What kind of strength? In the Lord. And then, what do I do then with this second? What, 
What is this um, it, in the strength of his might? It's also, I think, uh, sorry, I think it's also a phrase because it modifies the word strong. Exactly. It's a second modifier, isn't it? Yes, Pastor. So if we were, if we were diagramming this, we would have be strong in the Lord. And then a second, be strong and in the strength of his might. All right, and of his might would also be yes. afraid. Okay, very good, excellent, like that. All right, now let's go back up to our passage. How about this next? Uh, thing here. What is that? Phrase or clause? And what's it doing? I think, Pastor, it's a, it's a clause as well, because if I read it right, I think it's also a command. Okay, it's a command. Is this it's clause command. dependent or independent? <clears throat> I think it's an independent clause. Okay, good. And what makes you say that? Oh. Because I say command. I say command, Pastor, it, you know, it tells the subject is you, you put on, and then there's an object. The put on is an action, and then the object is the full armor of God. Okay, good. So we have a second independent clause, don't we, here? Uh, yes, and okay. it is put on the full armor. All right. And... Yeah, as you said, the subject is you, because again, a command, so it's implied. The verb is put on. Is that what you said? Yes, Pastor. Okay, and this verb, is this verb an action or a state of being verb? Is it describing an action or a state? If, if it's uh, literal, it is an action. It does not describe a state. Correct. Good. And... The object, then, it will have an object, and that object is? The armor. The armor. And then of God is the phrase okay. modifying armor, right? Yes, so that's sir. what we're to put on. Okay, good. So in the diagram here, we actually have this phrase. This clause is not modifying something. It's actually a second command. All right? Be strong. Let's see. This is... Uh, let me what be strong in the Lord, and that's describing what kind of strength. All right, and that's why we put it under strong, and then again a second modifier, what kind of strength, and then when we get to the second statement, put on the full armor of God. That's actually a a second independent clause. So it is what I mean by this is simply that it is a a parallel action. It is of equal importance to this first action up here. This is my first independent clause, okay, where he says, be strong. And if we are preaching this passage, we're going to have, at least so far, two main points, because this is an independent clause, and this is an independent clause. Now, what Paul didn't do is he could have put in here the word and, right? And that would have made it easier but in this case he left out the word and but it still functions as if it were there meaning there's two uh, two commands here of equal importance all right and they're both in the same they're both imperatives be strong put on the full armor of God all right you guys following me so far Okay, yes, so this will be uh, the last question for you, Pastor Tabs, and then we'll <laughs> let you off of the hook um, so that you will be able to stand firm. I mean, what, what do I do with this here? Where, where does that go? Is that another, uh, you know, is it a phrase or a clause? Is it dependent or independent? What, what do we have here? I think, Pastor, it is a... Uh dependent clause because the phrase so that is is the i no sorry i think it's dependent because it's a purpose clause because of yes. the word so that 
Yeah, OK, good. We have a, a notice here. Um, it's a clause because we have a subject, you. We have a verb, we'll be able. All right, I'll put that in another color. All right, so we have a subject and a verb. So this is a clause, but it's <laughs> dependent. And the key here is that tabs notice those first two words, so that. That's connecting me to something else in the paragraph. It doesn't stand by itself. It's dependent on something else. That's why we call it a dependent clause. So the idea of this, this statement, so that you will be able to stand firm, relies upon something else in the sentence. And here it is, what? How does this fit here? What's it modifying, Tabs? What's it connected uh, Pastor, to? I think that it is modified. I think it modifies the first two commands because if we put if we will be strong and we put on the full armor of god the purpose is so that we will be able to stand firm there you go it's giving us the the purpose or or we could say um um the result actually the result here all right so it's going to modify and i'm going to just indent it here right under the verbs here's the verb be strong B and put on, okay? And then the so that, and this is what I like to do on the diagram is I put these separate. So that tells me the result of be strong and put on. Okay, very good, very good. So, and then um, against the schemes of the devil, that would be when you can stand firm. Okay, and we won't go through the ref because our struggle. That would that would come under stand firm as, again. All right, so we won't go through the rest of it. But what I wanted you to see was to catch that the fact that there's two independent clauses here, even though the word and does not appear. Normally, we would expect the conjunction and uh, be strong and put on the full armor. But in this case, we, we just have uh, it's without the, that conjunction and. But it's still the same effect. It's still two independent clauses that we have here. All right. Now, what if what if it's been this way? And this, um, Pastor Renee, you're next. So I'm going to ask you this question. We're going to let Pastor Tabs take a break so he can go wipe the his nose from the nosebleed. Um, so let's. Let's consider this. What if it had been, uh, instead of put on the armor of God, what if Paul had said, putting on the full armor of God? All right. Would that be a phrase or a clause, and how would that connect? All right. What if Paul had said this? What do you think? First, let's ask the question, is this a phrase or a clause, putting on the full armor of God? Uh, it's a clause. It's a participle, put word putting. Yes, good. It's a participle. Now, is there a subject here, though? We have uh, a verb. No subject. There's no subject, uh, so is it a clause? So, sorry, it's a phrase. Good. You don't have to be sorry. It's good you yeah. caught that. That's, that's good. So it is a phrase. That means that would we put it, if we were to, to diagram, you tell me, which, where would this go? Putting on, would it be here like we had before? Put on the full armor was parallel no. to be strong okay it would not correct where would we put this or where would this yes, go yes it will uh it express uh how we become strong will be a description uh how to, to be strong so it modifies 
how like this so i put it under the verb because it's modifying how to be strong is that correct yeah yes yeah be confident you're correct now that's good yes. very good all right so notice that what this changing this verb from put on to putting on what it does is it now the emphasis is on this command be strong uh, before we had two parallel commands be strong put on the full armor so paul is emphasizing both of those he's he's giving two two commands so if we were to preach this passage how many outline points would we have one only well, well on the original verse we would have two but now with this change, if he had said putting on the full armor of God, it would change now to just one, one point. Esau, right? So, so the I'm I'm bringing this up again because I want you to pay. You know, just as Pastor Rene noticed, this changes now from two commands to one command, and how to carry that command out. How do we be strong? Putting on the full armor of God. Now that's not what Paul said. Paul said we're to do two things, be strong, that's one thing, and the second thing is put on the full armor of God, all right? I'm just pointing out that if it were a participle, what the difference would be and how we would interpret it, all right? And we see that interpretation reflected in the diagram, all right? It's indented under B, because be strong is the main independent clause, and this is just a phrase modifying that clause, all right? Okay, so any questions on that? Anybody have a question? Are we okay? All right. Now, there's, like I said, some of the, these passages have something a little hidden in there. Now, what you want to do when you finish your diagram, you want to look at other translations just to see what they have, all right? See if there's any significant differences. So let's do that. I, I did this when I diagrammed, um, is I checked with a few other uh, English translations, all right? And let's see, if you guys notice here, I have the NAS version, which we just did. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. The ESV is exactly the same. Uh, the NIV is, is very close. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The New King James, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Very similar. But notice the Net Bible, the New English Translation. And this, by the way, you can get, um, you can get online at, uh, I think it's netbible.org, if I remember correctly. Um, it's a pretty good English translation. They'll give you footnotes and other comments on the passage that are helpful. But notice, what's the difference here? I think, um, let me ask uh, Pastor Entz. You still there, Pastor Entz? Yes, Pastor. Good morning. I have a video. I'm just using uh, data. Oh, okay. I have the uh, regular uh, connection. So I'll just have you answer this short question and then uh, um, which, the what's the difference? Of, uh, yeah. The, the, the all the rest, they're really explicit commands. And uh, um, in the in, um, New English translation, it's a, it's a state. They are, yeah, if we look at the okay. first four, they're in all, in the Lord. yeah, they say be strong, okay, which is a state of being, right? The full sentence is you be strong. And then we, we talked about um, 
Uh, the subject is you, the verb is be, and the predicate Ooh. adjective is strong. But in the Net Bible, it says be strengthened. Strengthened. All right. Um, this is an action. Be strengthened. That's the difference. So the subject is still you. It's still a command. The verb here is be, and it's together now, strengthened. Strengthened is a verb, not an adjective. So here there's no, there's no object, all right, or predicate adjective, because this is now an action. Okay. Okay. So um, that makes me think a minute. Oh, wait a minute, then. Is in the is the original Greek word? Yeah. Is this all one word? Be strong in the Greek. Is it all a verb, or is it be the verb and then strong, an adjective? Oh. Okay. So this this introduces a question. They translated it this way. That might that makes it that, that makes a significant difference. Now I'm looking at. Um, not be and then strong, I'm looking at be strengthened as the verb. So the way to figure this out is we need to go to the interlinear. All right, so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna take you to the uh, interlinear. Let me remember to this time, last time I kept forgetting to share the screen. I'm gonna try to avoid that this time. So here, let me go to Interlinear, hopefully. Can you guys see that? You guys see my interlinear here? Ephesians 6. Um, all right, this is BibleHub.com. Just have the interlinear for Ephesians chapter 6. And if we take a look, we have this idea of henceforth or finally. And then notice this word. Empowered. Be empowered. It's a, it's a verb. In the Lord, there's not two separate words here for be and strong, okay? There is a word for strong in Greek, but here it's not separate. It's actually all one verb. So be strengthened or be empowered is a better translation because it's telling us it's, it's one verb. So as I mentioned to you, instead of you be strong, Subject, verb, predicate, adjective. It's actually you be strengthened. Subject, verb. All right. That's what the interlinear guides us. The Net Bible gave us a clue, so we wanted to check. Well, is the Net Bible correct? And actually, it is in this case. All right. All the other translations took this word be empowered and made it into be strong which changes the nature of this sentence from an action to a state but actually paul was commanding an action state of being. he wasn't commanding a state of being he was actually commanding an action now why does this matter is, am I just being grammar picky? What do they call those grammar Nazis? You know, people, ah, I want to just, you need to have perfect grammar here. No, actually, it's, this is significant in the interpretation. And I'll show you why. Let me go back to our, our notes. Oh. Do you guys see the, understand what the difference is that I'm, I'm describing here? All right, let me go back yeah. to the notes and I'll, just to make sure. All right. We have one case where, and this is how like the, the New American Standard, the ESV, you know, most of the English translations actually have this be strong. That is a state of being. That's describing a state. That would be saying Paul is commanding you be strong. And the implication is you need to find the strength in yourself. You be strong. Just like I might say, you be happy. You be, uh, you know, you be um, quick. You be, 
um, uh, you know, I can't think of words right now, <laughs> but just this idea of you be a certain condition, that would have imply you need to bring yourself to that place. So in this case, you be strong means you need to gain strength yourself. But actually, the Net Bible, and this doesn't happen often, actually, the Net Bible had the correct translation, you be strengthened. All right, you be strengthened. Again, we see from the interlinear, there weren't two words. There wasn't the Greek, because uh, normally the Greek word for be uh, is some derivative of ami. All right, and I can't remember, there's a Greek word for strong. It, it was something like in and uh, I don't remember. And do no, I don't, I've forgotten. So we can look at. But there's a separate word for the noun or adjective, be strong. But that's not what's in the Greek. It's actually one word. And do na. I think it's sauce. They. It's it's from and do na o, which is a verb that means be strengthened or be empowered. Okay, so why this is significant is one, because it's, it's taking something, a command that, that would put the um, responsibility on the subject. You be strong. You have to find strength. You need to strengthen yourself is the idea. Okay, instead he said you be strengthened. You be strengthened. Now, there's one other little piece that we need to, to understand here. Did we talk about the verbs last time? The, the mood, the voice, the voice, and the tense? Did we discuss that last time? In passing, Pastor. Just in passing? Okay. If, if you guys remember, there are... The passive voice. Yeah, the there's three voice. characteristics. Of verbs, all right. Um, one is called the mood. All right, there are different kinds of moods. We didn't cover this. Just want to make sure I'm not repeating myself. So we have the indicative mood. Um, Harris, brother Harris, what's the indicative mood? Um, it simply describes. Yeah, it's it's a it's description. A statement of. Yeah. Statement of. Fact, right? All right, it just says something as a, as a declaration, a statement. The imperative is what, Harris? Uh, imperative um, uh, commands. Good. All right, it's a command. All right, so uh, imperative is the command. Then we have the what we call the fancy word is interrogative. That simply is just question, interrogate, and question. Then we have the subjunctive. And that um, introduces a, a degree of uncertainty. So, for example, I, I will, um, or let's see, let's do it this way. Yeah, I, I will uh, go home. That's a, what's uh, the mood of this? Indicative. It's indicative. It's just making a statement. How about yes. go home? That's imperative. Imperative. Will you go home? Interrogative. Interrogative. Now, I might he may go. go home. That is subjunctive. It's not certain. Or even we can say, I should go home. That's still not a statement of fact. It's a statement that introduces a degree of uncertainty. Yeah, we did talk about this because we talked about optatives too. Remember that? Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot more time here. And then we finally have the, the conditional. 
okay, that is um, if I go home, then, okay. Now, and then we talked about the voice, and there were three types of voice, right? Active, all right, and active means the subject does the action. Passive, that is the, the action is done to the subject. And then in Greek, we have the middle, all right, which the subject does the action to himself or for his benefit. Now, let's go back here. Be strengthened. You be strengthened. What is the mood of, of this? You be strengthened. Actually, let me do both. Let's compare. So the translation, you be strong, we're going to do both. And you be strengthened. Let's see. We're on. Jonathan, why don't you take on these two since. Okay. So I want you to tell me what is the mood, the voice, and the tense for, for you be strong? You be strong. The mood is uh, imperative. Okay. The voice is um, passive. Is it? Because again, this is a subject verb. You be, okay. Go ahead. You be strong. This is translated not as a verb but as an adjective in this sentence, you be strong. I, this is not yet the verse that we are. This is the doing. verse. Yeah, this is okay. Ephesians 6.10, all right? And what I'm, what I'm doing is just having us look at comparing the, if we go, if we go with the New American Standard translation. Ah, okay, okay. All right? The mood's imperative, correct. The voice is, is actually active. is yeah. active because strong is not part of the verb it is yeah, an yeah. adjective here all right and what's the tense uh, the tense is present it's present tense good now if i go to you be strengthened where now this is the verb yes all right so here i'll just make it clear <laughs> subject is you Verb is be, verb is be, and strong. the predicate adjective is strong. All right. In this case, the subject is you. The verb is be strengthened, and there is no object. All right. So with this verb, if this is the verb be strengthened, is what is the voice? Passive. It's passive. Yes. And then the tense is present still. Still present. Okay, so notice what changed by this translation difference. The voice changed. All right. Now this may seem like really picky. This might seem like what are you spending all this time on one little word? Well, because the interpretation is hugely significant, different, because understanding that this actually is not a subject, verb, predicate, adjective, but actually just a subject and a verb, then that tells us that this verb is passive, meaning the action is done to the subject. You be strengthened. Whereas here, the action is done by the subject. In this case, the state. Um, the action or state in this case is done by the subject. Okay. I'm going to highlight this. But here, the action, and this is an action, is done to the subject.
Okay. So when we get to the next phrase, be strong in the Lord. All right, that's that's the, the next phrase in the Lord and in the strength of his might. If I were to diagram it, be strong in the Lord, this is what I would do. You be strong. And then what kind of strength is it? This is what the, because again, I'm in the Lord. That's right, Pam. Yes. Um, yeah. I think even when we have started uh, diagramming this, um, is it the word in the Lord instead of answering the question, what kind? Uh, it more answer the question, where? Because in the Lord, from, from that phrase itself, instead of answering the question, what, what kind of strength? Since the phrase is also of, uh, in the Lord and in, so it refers to, it answer more the question, where? I think, or yeah, we answer the question. What source? Yeah, and we're we're sort of pressured to to say that because that is the that's the correct I under, uh, interpretation here, is that the strength comes from the Lord, but because of the way that this was translated, this it really, translated. Yeah, I think it pushes us, it pushes grammatically towards what kind of strength. Mm. But we know that mm. <laughs> the strength has to come from the Lord. And so when we interpret it, we would probably do this. We would put it under B and then say where. Right? That's what you were saying. But because yeah. of the the way they translated it, that actually now introduces this idea. It makes it more confusing, not as clear. Whereas here, if be strengthened is my verb, and I'll just note it by the underlining. Now it's, it's much, makes much more sense because now it's be strengthened. And how am I strengthened in the Lord? or by the Lord, actually, is probably a better translation of the, that preposition in. It's actually by. Uh, it's the Greek word en, E-N, epsilon nu, nu which uh, um, is, can also be translated by. So you be strengthened by the Lord. That would make sense now because the verb is passive. So it's, it's something, an action happening to the subject from somewhere else, in this case, someone else. And here Paul says, it's the Lord. You be strengthened by the Lord and by the strength of his might. That I believe is the best translation because it doesn't, this translation introduces some uh, confusion and it's not exactly accurate. This translation is much clearer and more correct. Um, when, when looking at the Greek. Now we can imply from that, that doesn't mean this translation, we get the wrong answer. Just like you were saying, Jonathan, that, well, is it really where do we find the strength? Yeah, that actually is what that phrase is doing. But because the New American Standard and ESV, they translated it this way, it made that more difficult to determine. Okay, but we knew, um, what's the word? Uh, Naturally or in, inherently, we knew that in the Lord had to be the source. Okay, we know that theologically, but um, this translation actually makes that more clear and it, it affirms what our assumption is when we were interpreting that verse. So um, I, I bring this up for a couple reasons. One, to remind you to make sure you look at some other translations after you do your diagram, after you do any of your interpretive work. If you're going with a translation, you need to compare translations. Don't just trust one. 
all right? They're very good. A New American Standard, an ESV, an IV, New King James, they're all great translations, but they're not going to be perfect. And here's one example where uh, four of the best translations in English actually made this a little less clear or less accurate in how they translated. But the Net Bible, which I don't use often, but I, I noticed in this case, I do, I do look at it, had that difference. And in this case, they were right. Only, the only one out of the five that I looked at. And we confirmed it, though, with the interlinear. And that's the other thing I wanted to encourage you to begin. If you're not using an interlinear, begin to use one just to verify things, um, you know, sim simple things. Obviously, we, we don't. We aren't Greek experts, so um, we, we can't know everything from looking at a Greek text, but the interlinear at least can get, tell us some things that are helpful. And in this case, we notice from the interlinear that the English, uh, there were two things actually. Let me take you back to the interlinear for a moment. Um, All right. All right. Uh, one thing I showed you was this: that this word, Greek word, is the full verb. Be strengthened. Be empowered. All right. So we spent a lot of time on that. Now notice on the interlinear, they'll they will parse the verb for you below. Do you guys see? Oh, why is the box down there? I don't know. If, can you see the the box that's at the bottom right of the screen? I don't know why I put it down there, but. Below the, the verb here, maybe if I do this. I'm going to trick it. Oops. <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh, so much for that idea. All right. Well, here below the... Um, the verb, we get the parsings, and for some reason it's off my screen, but basically it's the V is for verb, P is for present, so it's telling us the tense, M, uh, M is for, it says present imperative, and then middle, or passive. So it tells us that this verb is either middle voice or passive voice, usually it's passive. All right, so we also find out the voice from uh, from the parsing of this that tells us the two things. One is that it's just one verb. There's not two words here. And secondly, that it is passive voice. All right. And so um, that's an important thing for us to, to recognize that we can learn from the interlinear. And then the other stuff we've talked about before. We can do a word study by looking up the Strong's word and, and that kind of thing. But I just wanted you to see that the uh, it affirms, it confirms the translation that was given by the Net Bible and that it is in the passive voice, which means, again, the, the significance here is that um, the, it's much more clear that, that the command is carried out that I'm not the one that makes myself strong, but that I am strengthened by someone else. In this case, Paul says, be strengthened by the Lord. All right? And so um, that's very important to, to recognize in this case because it moves from putting the pressure on us to I've got to find that strength myself, you know, I got to find the strength of God myself to, uh, I need to be strengthened by God. And so um, those are two you know, very different interpretations. And translation really helps clarify that from the Net Bible. Was there a question? Uh, the ascertain? Yes. Probably here. Uh, well, I can see the great difference and also the importance of having uh, these two translations side by side. Uh, is it possible 
that during the application of this verse, you can use these two translations, the passive, meaning that though, I, well, first, the active one, uh, that we are called to strive, you know, to strive, and yet we should not just depend on ourselves, but on the passive tense, that we should, we should never think that it is uh, just plainly our strength, but relying in the Lord. So I think if it's two things are presented during the preaching, then you realize that though we are called to take an action, we should not just fully trust ourselves because ultimately, in the end, it is the Lord who will strengthen us. Yeah, and the action is um, a little different with those two translations. Mm -hmm. The first translation, it implies the action is, I need to find the strength. I need to get strength. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, physically, it would be, you know, you lift weights or running, swimming, mm -hmm. um, basketball. You do these activities to make yourself strong. Right? That would be the idea behind you be strong. But you be strengthened is... You have to gain that strength from somewhere else. And in this case, we know it's in the Lord or by the Lord. So it really moves the, uh, it is a command. So we're called to do something, but we're not called to gain the strength ourselves. We're called to find the strength in God. Hmm. That put ourselves in a position to be strengthened by God. That's the difference. Hmm. All right. And again, it may seem yeah. subtle or small, but it's actually, you know, quite significant, you know, because if you were to tell somebody, you go find the strength yourself to fight this battle against um, Satan, that's different than saying you need to put yourself in a place to get strength from God. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's the, now, I think all of us would look at that passage, and even with the translation, you be strong, just like uh, Athan said earlier, we would probably recognize that strength comes from God, but technically the way that they translated it doesn't um, move that direction, all right? You be strengthened is much better, or you be empowered is, I think, even better. Um, you be empowered by God, and then the whole rest of the passage tells us how that empowering comes. It comes by, by the armor of God, by putting that on, all right? That's the means which we do that. Any other questions on this? Um, uh, Pastor, this is Gary. Um, um, morning. Morning. Uh, is it also uh, okay to consider because the writer is Paul? When he say be strong, it's always almost default to be strong in the Lord. In, in his letters. Yeah. Theologically, we would know that, that Paul would, would be, you know, pointing us to finding our strength in the Lord. So I think, I don't think any of us would have misinterpreted that passage, but um, I'm just trying to show you that the grammar by their, the translation difference that, that they made it a little more confusing by, by the translation they chose. But yeah, Paul definitely right preaches God's grace and, and that he's the okay. source. Thank you. So yeah, theologically it would support the idea of be strengthened where find our strength in God. God's the source. Um, Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sir Tim. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you have just said that uh, we will see you later on that the way to be strengthened is uh, by putting on the whole armor of God. But we, we have seen that they are parallel commands, right? They both fall to the right. Uh, to the left so yes uh, so we cannot unless it is putting on the whole armor of god we can we can then make the conclusion that uh, the way to be strengthened is by putting on the whole armor of god so is it just uh all right to make that um uh, you know, to make that interpretation also uh telling uh by, by saying that the way for us to be strengthened as the next 
first uh, tells us is by putting on the whole armor of God, even if uh, they they are just parallel. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there is something about the fact that Paul is making two separate commands. So this idea of be strengthened, I think, um, in one sense, we have to look at the context of the letter and what has Paul been saying. You, you know, this is where you have to really understand a, a few things, not only the background context to the letter, but also the the literary context, the flow of thought. So if you can remember how is Ephesians structured, the first three chapters are focused on who we are in Christ, what God has done in our salvation, right? No, there's only one command, in fact, it's to, to remember who we were in Christ as Gentiles. The last three chapters are our response to who we are in Christ, how we are to live in Christ, basically. And the last three chapters have almost 40 commands. So the first part of the letter is, is you know, focused doctrinally. It's focused on the theology of salvation, the soteriology. The last three chapters are focused on how do we respond to God's work in salvation. And he frames those last three chapters with the walk command. Uh, he says, first, walk in unity, chapter four. Then he says, walk in holiness, and then walk in love, walk in purity, walk in wisdom. Those are the five key commands in chapters four to six. And then when we get to the end, his command is no longer walk, it is stand. Um, and so we need to understand how this section fits into that whole flow of thought that Paul has been commanding them to walk, you know, in purity, walk in unity, walk in wisdom, walk in love. And then he gets to this last section where he says, finally, okay, let me sum it all up for you, Ephesians. Be strong, be strengthened in the Lord. All right, find your strength in God. And I think he's been telling them all along how they can do that. Because he says they're finally, it's sort of a summary statement, right? So he's summing up as he's moving towards this final section where he's going to say stand he's been saying walk 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 now he's going to say stand before he says that he gives this one command be strengthened by the lord and in the strength of his might i think he's been describing up to that point how that happens all right so i would at this point if i'm preaching this text i'm looking back on the other commands that he's given and if I walk in love, walk in unity, walk in wisdom, walk in purity, walk in holiness, that is, that is, I think he's summing those up by saying, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then he adds, put on the full armor of God. So there's one more um, general command he wants to give to stand firm by putting on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord, he says, and then he describes the whole uh, process of putting on armor. So I would say, um, Harris, that it's in the context, it has carries both the ideas of all that he said before about walking. We gain strength from that, and then also what he's going to say about the armor of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Pastor. So thank this you. is where all these things come together. We're doing grammar, looking at the details. We're also going to, you know, word studies, um, but, but also the stuff we did before, which was the background context to the letter, and then also the flow of thought, the literary context. How is the letter structured? How does this passage fit in that structure? We can't take it out and isolate it, uh, you know. So that goes beyond, you know, that's beyond the scope of the diagram. The diagram is just dealing with the grammar and the relationship between the phrases and clauses. But as we interpret it, we not only look at the grammar and the words the vocabulary, but we also have to look at the context, as you know. All right? Yeah, thank you, Pastor. So that was a long answer to a short question, but it was a good question. Any uh, 
Any other questions or comments on this passage before we look at another one? All right. Your noses are not bleeding enough yet, so we're going to do some more, some more diagramming. You have to get out your towels to wipe your nose from the heavy blood. All right. Let's um, go back to my notes here. Okay. Uh, all right. Ephesians 4, this time, uh, let me see, I'm going to ask Pastor Manny, you've been quiet, so we're going to put you in the hot seat right now, can you please read this passage, and then uh, same thing, we'll identify the independent clause, and then talk about the phrases and clauses a little bit. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 therefore I the prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a matter in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience showing tolerance for one another in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace all right. What is the independent, the independent clause here? The independent clause is, I implore you. I. I implore. Implore you. The subject is I. Okay. Verb is implore. And the object is you. All right. That's it. All right, so now what's interesting or unique about this is the fact that the independent clause is separated by a phrase. Paul injected a phrase in between the subject and the verb. All right, so you had to do a little searching to find that subject and verb in the sentence. So, so here we have, I implore you, uh, as the main independent clause. So if we're diagramming, we would say, therefore, here, let me, I'm going to do this. We would do this, therefore, I, that's the subject, and the prisoner of the Lord is modifying what, Manny? What is this a phrase or a clause? The sub prisoner of the Lord. The prisoner of the Lord is a it's a, a phrase. Yep, because there's no verb. And what is it? How's it functioning here? What is it modifying? It tells us about something about that subject, I. Yeah, it's describing I in this case, right? It's telling us something about the subject. That he's saying, I am a prisoner of, of the Lord. Okay, good. And then the implore you. So what I do on the when I diagram this is I just put a line in here. That, that connects them. Let me make this a little thicker. Um, okay, why can't I? I'll do that later. So I implore you. Now, um, to walk. What do I do with this? What is it? How does it seem like it should fit? Or what is it? Where, where would it seem like just your feeling about where it should be connected? This is a new thing. We haven't talked about this before. But what does it feel like it should go with in the sentence? 
Is it, let me, as you're thinking about it, let me just ask a couple questions. Is it a new thought? Is it a, another clause? Is it a, uh, what, what kind of a, go ahead. Pastor Tim, it, it should, I think it should go with the dependent clause. It okay. With... Actually, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, and I, this is not, not easy. It's, it's something we haven't talked about. So this is why I chose this verse. Um, what does it feel like it should go to though? Just like your, you may not know the right grammar explanation, but, but just how, how does it feel like it should, does it connect to, is it a new thought? Is it connected so, to? It, it, is, uh, it is connected to, to what the command is if the, if the command is to implore, what uh, what is the specific instruction is or command is to walk. So uh, if I will try to do this, probably it will be under the word implore. So what kind of, I mean, you know, whatever. Yeah. Maybe it would feel like it's connected to implore in some way, right? Yeah. Because if he just says, I implore you, that what? technically that is a complete thought, but it's still, I implore you to do what? Yeah. I implore you how? Mm. I implore you for what purpose? I, right? There still seems like it, it needs something else. And mm. here, he's imploring... The object is you, just as Manny said. So the subject is I, Paul. Paul's saying, I implore. That's the action. I implore you, Ephesians. That's the subject or the uh, object. But he doesn't stop there. He says to walk. And so what this is, and this is why it says your new, uh, I'll give you the technical term, but then I'll just explain what it's doing here. This, this is technically, this to walk is called an object compliment all right uh do you know the word compliment it, it, it's not uh it's not this compliment is to give somebody a uh you know tell them something nice you, you look nice today you you are you are kind you're a very loving person those are compliments all right but that's not this word this word is complet with an e compliment means something that goes with something that's connected to Something that uh, completes, like my wife is my compliment. Pastor Tim, is that a a concept that is uh, in opposite to the word supplement? Uh, um, you, okay. You're saying it. Um, this is to add. To say something. it is a. Yes. So the complement. The the difference is. A supplement is an addition to something that is already sufficient in itself, but yes. a complement is something that completes it, something that completes the thought. Yeah. So we would say, yeah, my wife is, is my complement. And that means she, she goes, she's with me. She, she completes the marriage in a sense. Whereas, whereas supplement would be add, adding to something, something that's, that um, you know, you're adding a, a supplement that's like a vitamin, you know, you're taking your vitamins, you're adding to your diet. So an object complement is something, it's a word or, or a series of words that goes with the object. All right, that is attached to it, that completes it. All right, so in this case, to walk completes this idea. He's imploring them to a specific thing. I implore you to walk. He's not just saying, I implore you. That could be anything, you know, um, and you have to know the context to understand, implore them. But there's always this idea of to what? What are you imploring? And implore is the idea of beg, urge, 
um, stress. Um, it's not easy. So I urge you, I implore you. And then Paul says to walk. So this is, this goes with, and this is what I'm trying to say is this goes with the object. It's as a unit. All right. It's kind of like another example would be, um, um, he makes me happy. All right, subject he. Verb makes, object me. Then we have this word happy. That's really an object complement. It's completing the idea or completing the desired state in this case of the action. So we call this an object complement. <clears throat> All right. A certain name. Yes. Uh, have we answered the question? What's the uh, purpose of the prison or of the Lord? Uh, oh, it's the it's the phrase. It's a phrase describing the subject, giving further description of the subject I. Okay. So you could think of it like this. He didn't put these words in, but. I know you're discussing. I know you're discussing imploring you to walk as a compliment also of the word, of the subject. It's an object compliment. So you are which... saying that. Okay, so you're saying both of these are related to the subject. No. Um, but this, the prisoner of the Lord is not really an object compliment. Also. No, no, I'm sorry if I'm confusing. Um, the prisoner of the Lord is a separate phrase that is connected to the subject. It's modifying the subject. It's telling us, describing the subject. I, who am the prisoner of the Lord, or who is the prisoner of the Lord. Um, all right, so that's a separate thing, modifying the subject I. What we're talking about now is this, these two words, to walk. And what do we do with them? And in this case, they connect to this, the object you. They're completing the idea. I implore you to walk. So they're, they're connected to the object and describing something that what, what Paul is desiring of the object. What he wants the object from the object. Okay, you could have said yeah. I am. I am yeah, go ahead. Uh, because uh, what, from what I can see from this is Paul is also um, by mentioning that he is the prisoner of the Lord, he is also somehow giving them the idea on how they should walk. In a sense that um, being a prisoner, it, uh, being a prisoner of the Lord, um, that is connected also with uh, his appeal to them on how they should walk. Well, he's going to describe how they should walk in a minute because he says, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. I, I think that the prisoner of the Lord takes us back to chapter 3 at the beginning where he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. And um, I think he's he's reminding them he is a prisoner because of his ministry of the gospel and his own commitment. So he could be, you know, putting it there as sort of an example of the commitment required to, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Um, you know, that might be why he inserted that phrase again, or he could be connecting back to chapter three and just reminding them of the importance of what he has to say. You know, I'm in prison now. So this adds emphasis and emotion to his urging. Here I am in prison for the gospel, and so I'm urging you, please, please respond to what God has done in Christ by walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. So I think it, it gives more urgency to his, to his, the word implore. Uh, I would probably see it more that way just because of all that he said in chapter 3 where he connects to that phrase, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. So as a prisoner, I'm urging you to do to do, you know, walk in a manner worthy. I think that's how I would see it more. Thank you, Professor. But certainly you're right in the fact that 
he is a prisoner that served as an example of what it looks like to walk in a worthy manner. Um, you know, so that idea is a correct statement. I, I would see probably his purpose for putting it there is more connected to adding to the urgency of his appeal. And so, um, and it comes, and I think we see that as well, because he says, he doesn't make a statement, I am the prisoner of the Lord. He says, I, I the prisoner of the Lord. So he's not declaring him, the main idea isn't that I am a prisoner. He's saying, the main idea is I implore you. But he inserts that phrase, the prisoner of the Lord, to, I think, bring some urgency. In it, and it's connected to the subject I. He's giving further description of himself. And then we have the verb implore, you the object. And then what I was introducing to you guys here is this, this idea of, again, the object complement. Or this, this completes sort of the verbal idea of the sentence. All right, I implore you to walk. It's almost like, uh, uh, what would be another example? Um, I, I said hello. Oh, no, that wouldn't work. I said hello. No. I think this one up above, he makes me happy, is probably the, uh, a, that'd be a better, uh, another example of that. He makes me, is the subject, verb, object, and then happy adds to what goes along with the object. All right. So whether or not you remember this term object complement, I just want you to, to understand the concept is there are times where some words will actually connect to the object that go with the object. It's describing further what, in this case, Paul is imploring of the object. All right, I implore you to walk it. It completes uh, the, verbal, the verbal idea. And so in going with this, we would have, let's, get, let's go back to our, I implore you to walk. And then I have this here, in a manner worthy. Um, I don't remember where we're at. I think we were with you, Pastor Manny. Let me just ask you a couple more questions here. So in a manner worthy, tell me what that is. Is that a phrase or a clause? I was hoping the interruptions would make you forget. <laughs> <laughs> in, a manner, in a manner worthy of the calling is, um, I'll put that under to walk. Okay. Is it a phrase or a... Or a a clause. It's a phrase. Yeah, there's no verb. And then you, you have it modifies how to walk. Is that, is that the idea? It seems, yeah, yeah, Pastor Tim, it seems to be um, modifying the walking. The manner of walking, you know, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, how to walk. Yeah, I'm just putting, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's describing. Um, it's describing here how to how to walk because to walk by the way is is a verbal idea all right so in a worthy manner how to walk it's going to modify that verb walk how are we to walk in a worthy manner okay and a worthy manner worthy of the calling okay so technically it would be this in a manner And then worthy of the calling is describing what kind of manner. Okay. I can get this in here. What kind of manner? Yeah. Uh, 
sorry, got that delay here. Okay, it looks like I'm going to have to shrink this. Try that. All right, are there any, any questions about that? Okay, so we're still with the, the independent clauses. I implore you to walk in a worthy manner. All right, Manny, what's this next? With which you've been called. Is that a phrase or a clause? Which you have been called. It's a clause. Good. Because we have the subject you and have been called as the verb. So is it a dependent or independent clause? Is this a new thought? No, I, I don't think it's it's a new thought, Pastor Tim. So it would be dependent, right? And what tells it's us this is dependent? Clause. With the word which points to something else. Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're correct. So this is a clause. You have been called is a subject verb. But because we have these two words at the beginning, with which, that tells us that this clause is modifying something else. It's connected to something else. Yes. And in this case, what is it connected to? It's the calling. Yes. So we would put it, and I won't be able to fit it here. We would put it under the calling. Which calling? Or what kind of calling? The calling with which you've been called. That calling. Okay? All right. I'm trying to... F there. Okay? So, now... We go back to with all humility. Well, let's think about this. Where first tell me, is this a phrase or a clause? Manny? With all humility is a phrase. It's a phrase. And where does it go? What does it modify? What's it connected to? It is connected to walking. Yes. It's modifying to walk, and in what, how does it modify it? The, it? It tells us how we walk. There you go. So we would put it under to walk. Okay. And the same with gentleness, correct? Because it's with all humility and... Yes. Gentleness. And gentleness. So I would do it this way. And then he adds with patience. And then he adds showing tolerance for one another. And then how we show tolerance. And then being diligent. Okay. This is this is actually the hard part in diagramming Pastor Tim. Where do we put these things? Which <laughs> which word parallel parallel switch? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I want as we go through is to notice, okay, here's a phrase with all humility. That's a phrase. And I think about okay, where does it go? Well it it modifies it tells us how, because that word with tells us how. So we we go back to this idea of walk, gentleness, humility, and gentleness with humility patience. Humility and gentleness parallels. Humility and gentleness parallels each other. Yes. And when we go to patience, uh, I'm confused where whether I put it along with the with the, the, the uh, with humility and gentleness, or should I put it with uh, humility with. Uh, in a manner. Oh, so should it go to in a manner with patience? 
Is that what you're yeah, asking? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm confused. Uh, my difficulty lies in which, if, if, if this phrase with patience, parallels humility and gentleness, but the way you do it, you put it under, in a manner. Yeah. So what this is doing here is, um, we see here. The main idea is I implore you to walk, and then Paul gives one, two, three, four, five ways in how they are to walk in a manner worthy, um, with all humility, with patience, showing tolerance, being diligent. So here, the main theme of this sermon, if I were preaching this text, the focus would be walking in a worthy manner. You know, walking in a, you know, walking in a worthy manner, and how do we do that? Well, he gives us, you know, these five descriptions of how to do that. Yeah, so with each phrase, we're asked the question, okay, where does this go? <laughs> and so usually what I do is just say it likely goes with something right before it, all right? Or in this case, we have a list, one, two, three, four, five things that Paul describes here. And you just kind of have to, with each one, Think about what makes sense. I implore you to walk in a manner with all humility. Well, it makes sense that that goes with either walk or implore because it's telling, it's describing how we're going to do something. In what way are we going to do something? So it takes a lot of common sense, Pastor Tim. Kind of does, yeah. What what seems to fit? And sometimes common sometimes common sense is not so common with us, Pastor Tim. <laughs> Well, and, and I'll, we'll talk about, uh, we won't get to it this week, but next week, you know, when we go back, we're going to go back and then I'll just, we'll go through the steps, the specific steps for diagramming. Um, you know, I'm, I haven't done that with you yet. I haven't reviewed those yet because we've been just sort of looking at the building blocks. So we'll come back and then I'll, I'll show you the specific, or we'll review together the specific steps and how we take each phrase and what questions do we ask with each phrase to tell us where it goes. Right now, I'm just sort of doing... Yeah, the common sense approach or what what seems to make sense. But then next week, we'll come back and do the more structured um, approach to this. Hopefully, Lord willing. All right. But what I want you to see, too, is notice how the outline to the teaching the passage, once we get the diagram figured out, it really presents to us the outline. Five ways to walk. Or how we're called to respond to our salvation. Five ways to respond to our salvation. Something like that, right? One, two, three, four, and five. Okay? All right. Well, this just feels like all of you have used up all of your Kleenex and your towels to wipe your nose, so maybe... Maybe this is a a good time to to break. Sorry, I'm getting some something funny is going on with my computer here. Okay, there. Okay, yeah, I think this will be a good time to to break here. Unless you guys have, do you have any other questions or? comments. I know there was a lot of technical discussion, looking at a lot of details here, but honestly, this is how the way that you um, will improve in diagramming, the way that you will become better at it is just by doing it and then having t and being confronted with these different things. You know, as I've said many times, the English language is rather complicated in its grammar. There are so many, I mean, I was learning stuff today as I was reviewing for our <laughs> for our uh, session, you know, and again, I, English is my first language, but I'm still, there's so many technical things about it. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is avoid too much technical stuff, but we have to deal with some of it in order to, to be as precise as possible. That's why I spent all that time on be strong and be strengthened because uh, understanding the grammar there does matter because it will affect your preciseness in your interpretation, okay? So 
And that's what we're after first, accuracy. That's our number one goal, always, right? Be diligent to show yourself approved, handling accurately the word of truth so that we need not be ashamed. So that's our primary calling is accuracy. And then second to that is as we're teaching is to be clear, clarity. And the only way we can be accurate and the only way we can be clear is if we really understand um, understand what, what's going on in the passage, which means we, we need to understand the grammar as best we can. Not that we have to name every part of speech and tell what every word is. Oh, that's a noun. That's a verb. That's an object. Compliment. That's a predicate adjective. That's a subject. That, that's not what we're after. But, but we know that, that those descriptions tell us something. If I know that I have a verb of action, that tells us something different than if I have a verb of being. If I have an imperative versus an indicative, that tells me something different. If it's a passive voice or an active voice, that's something different. And it affects our theology because as we talked about, if it was an active voice, be strong, then that means the subject's doing the action. If it's a passive voice, you be strengthened, that means that these actions being done to the subject, those are two very different things, all right? And in that passage, to be accurate, we would have to understand it as a passive action, all right? Can we, are there other verses, Pastor Tim, that we can, uh, that those uh, incident uh, like Ephesians six ten uh, happen. There's another uh, verse that in the translation you will not immediately uh, see the the exact uh, if it is active or passive, but the interpretation is more on leaning on the active. Yes, yeah, there's um, uh, I mean, one that comes to my mind is uh, in Ephesians five eighteen, where he says, "Be filled by the Spirit." Um, you know, there it's clearly "be filled" is the verb, and it's passive. Um, so if we had thought that you be filled, where filled is a state, be full of something. Um, that would mean, you know, could be confused as an active. You fill yourself with something. But because it's, we know it's be filled, both of the words together are a verb, we know that it's a passive. That's, that's a passive form of the verb. We'll look at a verse next week. We'll do one more in Ephesians 2, where it, it won't be dealing with the passive or active voice, but we will be dealing with a situation where a participle is translated as a regular verb meaning you can't tell it's a participle from the translation. And that's another thing we have to be aware of. So we'll, that'll be a new thing. We'll talk about that next, next week. Now, I, I'm not, I don't want you to be um, nervous about your translations. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make the translations seem poor. I, I wanna just again affirm as far as English translations go, um, the English Standard, the New American Standard, uh, New King James are excellent, all right? But there are places where they are not as precise as they could be. And so we just, if we're going to be students of the word, we have to do and be diligent like Paul tells us. Then we've got to look at the details and just make sure, all right? Because sometimes a translator will, will translate a certain way because it's easier to read. Or at the time, it might seem like a more, like, like the translation makes more sense. Um, and the NIV does that typically. They're more interpretive than the others. Usually, they're very good, a very good interpretation, but not always, because they're trying. Their goal is to make it more readable. And when you do that, you naturally will, will have to change some things. And sometimes those changes make it less clear or a little, a little less accurate. So... All right, and it'll be the same thing, guys, when you look at whether you're, if you're uh, using a Tagalog or Sabuan of Asayan or Ilongo or translations that you need to have do the same thing. 
you've got to check and you're going to end up having to go back and check not just English, but go back to the interlinear and see, okay, is this Tagalog word or phrase a correct representation of what's in the original? The original is a participle. Is that accurately reflected in the Tagalog past text? Um, so you have to do the same thing when you're dealing with translations. All right, which makes our job a little tougher, but if it wasn't tough, then then Paul was, uh, you know, Paul Paul wouldn't have to tell Timothy to be diligent, which means uh, you know work hard. <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned earlier my audio was some trouble. Is it still still a problem? My audio in and out uh, no, there's just some when you're speaking it's still understandable but uh, there is uh, some noise that goes with your voice oh okay but you're still understandable to a certain. yeah it seems like my signal tonight some there's a problem maybe maybe it's a choppy not a clean signal. So maybe there's a small, maybe there's a small still voice. <laughs> maybe maybe too many people are using uh, using watching movies on the Wi-Fi here. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I know this is a, a challenge. Just uh, we're covering a lot of technical material. Um, so we'll do some another example next week. Uh, if you have questions that come to your mind, you know you can always message me or, or bring them up here. I just I don't want to leave you confused. So if if something really doesn't make sense, you know please I don't want you to to be too embarrassed to ask me uh, questions. And if if you don't want to ask in the group, you can ask uh, you know send it by message. Um, if so, if anything's confusing too, you you can watch the video again, and maybe if you pause it and think, that might help as well. And then there's you know there is some good stuff online about English grammar, but there's so many sites you have to be careful. Um, so many English grammar sites, and not all of them are the most helpful. I've been looking at many of them the last few weeks, and some of them are helpful, and some I. Uh, they're not so <laughs> um, and that you won't have examples from you know scripture I mean they're going to be secular lectures and things like that so I always want to try to use examples from the Bible so we can be working through that together because in the end that's what we're trying to better understand and interpret so any final um, questions before before we sign off this, this morning you guys had enough? <laughs> so you need to do is everybody message Pastor Robbie and just say, oh, this was the most amazing explanation. Now I understand everything. It was the best English lecture I ever heard. And then what I'll say is I lost the video. <laughs> so we can't watch it. <laughs> All right. Well, BJ, let me ask you uh, if you wouldn't mind closing our time in prayer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Happy break.